Problem solving is essential to all aspects of life, but it's especially important for coding and software engineering. At the end of the day, it's why developers are paid the big bucks. Today, I'll help you become a better problem solver, and that wouldn't be possible without the amazing support of this video sponsor, Squarespace. More on them in a bit. Here's what I've learned. Problem solving can be broken down into three main categories, matching, debugging, and innovating. Part one, matching. Most problems in the world have been solved. People way smarter than me have come up with efficient algorithms and design patterns. So the next time you're thinking about how to best organize your code or decrease its runtime, it's highly likely you can find an existing solution to fit your needs. Step 1.1, learn the common algorithms. If you're in college, you'll learn these in your algorithms or advanced algorithms classes. I'm talking about breadth first search and depth first search, binary search, merge sort, and so on. And if you're not in college, no worries, just pick up an algorithms textbook. At Rice, we actually used Algorithms by Jeff Erickson, and you can find it online for free. Jeff Erickson is a legend, and he deserves a special shout out for writing an incredible book and publishing it under the Creative Commons license. The textbook walks you through all the algorithms you need to know, along with their common applications. You'll learn the theory, and at the end of every chapter, you'll do exercises to use the algorithms you just learned. Now a quick disclaimer, you'll probably never use any of these algorithms at the job as a software engineer, but they refine your problem solving skills, especially when it comes to runtime and efficiency. So you'll never have to implement something like merge sort, you'll just use the default library function. But understanding how the sort works under the hood is really valuable. Step 1.2, learn the common data structures. And I don't mean just learning what an array is or a hash map, but rather understanding how these data structures are used in the algorithms you just learned in the previous step. Remember, algorithms are just theory. In the real world, you'll have to implement these algorithms with the help of specific data structures. And depending on what you're trying to accomplish, some data structures will be better suited for the job. For example, many problems can be thought of as graphs, which means they can be solved by common graph algorithms like Dijkstra's or breadth first search. But graphs can be represented in many ways. They can be thought of as nested hash maps or nested arrays, or even a class with a value field and an edges field. Step 1.3 learn the common design patterns. The previous two steps will help with general computer science proficiency and interview preparation, because at the end of the day, any lead code question can be answered with a specific algorithm and data structure combination. But at the job, as a software engineer, you'll be exposed to design patterns way more than theoretical algorithms. For example, if you only want one instance of an object in your application, you might want to use the singleton design pattern. Or if you're trying to break out a part of your code base into its own microservice, you might implement a hexagonal architecture. A good way to learn these design patterns is by browsing through the engineering blogs of companies you respect. For example, at work, I'm currently breaking out our payment service from the rest of the monolith, and I read Netflix's blog for inspiration. As you write and review more code, you'll get a feel for which design patterns work best for which use cases. Step 1.4, learn the industry data structures. I'm not sure if data structure is the right word here, but what I mean is the implementations found in industry. For example, in the previous step, you might've learned about the queue data structure or the cache, but in industry, you'll probably use something like RabbitMQ or Redis. And you might've learned about hash maps and key value pairs. Well, in industry, you'll probably use a key value store like DynamoDB. By learning about these common technologies, you'll have an easier time thinking about system design. And when you come across a use case in your own project, you'll know which service to use to move forward. Honestly, just coding in industry is the best way to become familiar with a lot of these buzzwords. But another way is by preparing for system design interviews, like how would you design Twitter or Facebook or tiny URL? Step 1.5, use your personal experience. As you continue in your software engineering career, you'll undoubtedly face all sorts of problems from local development setup issues to nasty bugs in your code. It's good practice to document your learnings, either in a company wiki or in your own personal notes. Jot down what the problem was, how you solved it, and link or bookmark any relevant sources like Stack Overflow posts or anything else you read. I promise your future self will thank you. And there are already implicit documentation sources like each of your pull requests, which basically live forever. So feel free to go back and reference them to jog your memory. By learning common data structures, algorithms, and industry best practices, you'll have ample resources to supplement your own personal experiences as you face new problems. Much like you work towards leveling up your problem-solving abilities, it's time to level up your websites. Squarespace allows you to collect email subscribers and convert them into loyal customers. You can easily start with an email template and then customize it by applying your brand ingredients like site colors and logos. You can also display posts from your social profiles on your website. And whenever you publish new content on your website first, you can automatically push those updates to your favorite social media channels so your followers can share them too. 
And as you build out your personal brand and business, you have powerful blogging tools at your fingertips that allow you to share stories, photos, videos, and updates. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Nelman Kapoor for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Now let's debug, debug, debug. Part two, debugging. So you're really good at matching your unique problem to something that has already been solved. And you're in the middle of implementing your solution, but the code is buggy and you can't figure out why. Well, this is a different type of problem solving. It's debugging. There are different errors you're going to face, from compiler errors to logical errors. So let's break down how to think through some of these common problems. Step 2.1, Google the error. If your code doesn't compile, or it does, but you're getting a runtime error or some funky error message that has nothing to do with the code you've written, it's time to Google and use Stack Overflow. Chances are the problem has nothing to do with your logic, but something to do with your operating system setup or the library that you're using. Chances are someone has faced the exact same issue, so browsing for a few minutes should point you in the right direction. And honestly, I'm only half joking, sometimes the best troubleshooting you can do is just restarting your laptop. Step 2.2, write tests. Writing tests is one of the best ways to catch issues, especially if your code is getting long and has many subcomponents. Unit testing every chunk of logic is effective in narrowing down where the error is happening, so you can continue debugging more efficiently. So in English, write out what the output should be. Like, it should return the sum of the two inputs, or it should return negative one if the inputs are null. There's actually a whole school of thought called test-driven development, or TDD, which basically advocates for writing your tests even before you start writing any code. This forces you to really think about what you want your code to do, so there's a lower chance you confuse yourself during implementation and introduce some sneaky bugs. This not only helps you debug, but also ensures that other people can't just change the code since the test will fail and alert them that they're doing something that was not previously expected. Step 2.3, try many solutions. Google and Stack Overflow will present you with many possible solutions. Why? Because many people have tried many different things. The internet is a wild place and it's your job to sift through the information. Unless someone recommends rm-rf, you can safely try most other suggestions. So start with whatever is top voted, follow the advice and see if it fixes your problem. If not, read some of the other comments or Google some more and try something else. And remember, Stack Overflow isn't the only resource. Read blogs, go to the GitHub source code if the library is open source and search through open and closed issues and browse through recent pull requests to understand new changes to the code base. Step 2.4, print debug or use the debugger. If your code is compiling and there are no weird exceptions and the only problem is that your code isn't doing what it was expected to do, it's time to debug further. In this case, Google might help, but more likely you'll just have to investigate by yourself. This is where print debugging or using the debugger come in handy. And print debugging is just a fancy way of saying write print statements everywhere. With this strategy, you're trying to answer two basic questions. One, is the code going through the path I expect? And two, does it have the right values every step of the way? You won't believe how many times I just forgot to call the function or I was passing in the wrong arguments. I personally prefer print statements over using the debugger because I'm just lazy and don't want to have to hit the arrows to either enter or skip code paths. Also, setting up the debugger can be a real pain, but I know a lot of people who swear by it, so it's totally up to you. And sometimes after all these debugging, everything will look okay. The values are fine, the code path is getting hit, but the output is still wrong. Now it's time to check the logic. Step 2.5, double check the logic. There's no formula here, and a lot of what I'm gonna tell you comes from experience, but here are some common gotchas. Double check your Boolean logic. I can't remember how many times I used an or when I should have used an and. Double check your loops. Are they infinite? Are you updating whatever you wanna update correctly? Double check your control flow. Are your if else statements correct? Are you early returning? Double check your mutation. Are you mutating the right thing? Are you deep copying if necessary? Double check your parameters. Are you passing by reference or by value? Step 2.6, rewrite the code. This one is painful because I've had to do it so many times. I've tried for hours to fix the issue, but with no luck. So I scrap everything and restart from a clean slate. And even though I swear I write the code the exact same way again, somehow the second time it works. This is the plight of the programmer. But in all seriousness, sometimes the best thing you can do is start over. And there's a lot to be said about writing the code functionally with no state, but that's a whole other topic. So I'll leave it for some other time. If you're curious, just Google functional programming. <sighs> you're a master matcher and debugger now. Let's go. This brings us to the final bucket of problem solving. Part three, innovating. Remember when I said most problems have been solved? Well, the keyword is most. There are a set of problems that haven't been solved. And these are the problems our greatest minds are working towards every day. 
Now, there's a very low probability you or me will ever encounter these sorts of problems. You only really see them in academia. So unless you're doing a PhD, don't really worry about them. Instead, much like I'm doing, just admire these smart people and be grateful that they're pushing the bounds of our knowledge, of how much we understand the world around us. That's all I have to say about innovating. So I'll leave you with a philosophical question. Do we discover solutions or do we invent them? Hopefully by now you have a better understanding of how to approach problems in your day-to-day -day life, whether that be coding, woodworking, or whatever else. I wish you nothing but the best. That's all I have. Till next time, cheers.